I was 17 years old. I was driving on the Highway 50 in Sacramento, California, and I heard a radio show talk about rich dad, poor dad, and how poor people or middle class people think very differently than rich people. I never really understood that. I grew up upper lower class, lower middle class most of my younger life. I thought that everybody kind of thought the same. I thought you work really, really hard for years and years and years, go get a college degree, and then one day you'll be able to retire, make lots of money, blah, 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 all that great stuff that we all know is kind of not really the path of progress in today's world. So I heard about this at age 17. I immediately went to a bookstore, Barnes and Nobles, and bought that book and then read it cover to the cover within a few quick days. And I told everybody about it and I said, you should read this book too. So if you're like me, you read Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki before you ever got started in real estate investing. I bought this book immediately though after these people talked about it on the radio and I went to a bookstore, if you can believe that, back in the day. Uh, Barnes and Nobles and bought it, read it cover to cover, and it changed my life. It actually, for a little bit of period of time, ruined my life for a little while because it had me thinking very differently than everybody else around me. I got obsessed with the idea of being on the right side of this quadrant. In fact, this is the first time this book or any of the other books talks about the cash flow quadrant. Now, most of us in this business, when we're investing in real estate, decided one day saying, I'm going to invest. I'm going to do something better for my life. I'm going to go full time in real estate, buy some rentals, flip some houses, wholesale, whatever, maybe start my own business. Who knows? Whatever path you decided to choose. And I'm going to go from employee and one day get to investor over here. There's many paths to go from here to here. The chances though of most of us watching this video being already in this I quadrant, truly being in that I quadrant is very slim. We can also fool ourselves over time as we're building our business, as we're running a real estate career, as we're going full time from employee to a real estate investor or any kind of business out there at all, thinking in reality that we're a business owner investor. When I bet you 99 out of 100 people watching this video and myself included for a very long time, we're still on the left side of this quadrant, trapped in the employee, self-employed side, trying to get over here where apparently all the awesomeness in our lives can be. So in this video, I'm gonna go over kind of these steps again, give you a refresher of the cash flow quadrant. I'm gonna go over the journey of what it kind of takes to go from employee, self-employed business owner, investor in the real estate investing career. I've done this over the years. I've spent a lot of time doing this. I've tricked myself more than once in many businesses and many investment careers that I thought that I was actually a B and I side of things when in reality I was an S the whole time. It's okay to be on this side of the quadrant if you're aware you're on that side of the quadrant. So let's go over this a little bit further. So first off, employee. Most of us start off over here in the employee quadrant. We have a full-time job. Maybe we make a lot of money, maybe we don't, but we earn our money trading time for dollars. Now we start investing in real estate. We say, I'm gonna go invest in real estate. I'm gonna go start buying some houses. Let's talk about flipping houses or even being a full-time real estate agent or a wholesaler or agent or whatever, it doesn't matter, or a landlord that also manages their own properties. You do any of those things, you're immediately jumping all the way in here to the S quadrant. This is where you're self-employed. You're trading your, basically, you're tra still trading your time for dollars, but you own a little bit more of your time. You're able to choose what you wanna do. You don't really have a boss. You're like me, you're psychologically unemployable. I tried having a job for a period of time in my younger life, didn't really work out too well, and I've been self-employed pretty much since I was 20 years old. As being self-employed and running my own business, I realized, hey, the more time and the more effort I put into something, the more output I could probably get, the more return I could probably get uh, as well if I'm doing the right things. But still, if I'm flipping houses and I'm the one calling all the contractors, I'm the one sourcing the deals, I'm the one managing start to finish of acquisitions, all that great stuff, even managing all my teams, employees or whatever, and growing up with this whole business, maybe I was flipping hundreds of houses, I flipped over 650. Maybe I'm thinking I'm a business owner, maybe I'm even thinking I'm an investor, but if my entire business and my entire system depends on me showing up every day, day in, day out, guess what? I'm self-employed. So a system only works if you're not in it. If you're still in your business and it only works when you're in it and you're running that system and it only, that system only works while you're in it, you don't really have a system. You have a cool way of doing things, basically the way you do things. Over time, maybe you go from self-employed to business owner. Maybe at this point, you do have a team. Maybe you hired a CEO for your business. Maybe you're more the visionary and you're able to direct things as an owner and not be involved in the day-to-day. -day. Maybe you have COOs. Maybe you have people that run a good chunk of your business and maybe you only are there for like the decision-making aspects of it or the bigger picture things and that's it. Maybe you're able to sit there and say, hey, maybe you don't have to show up and decide, 
uh, whether or not a property gets purchased or not, because you have good guidelines and good team members to be able to do that for you. Maybe all the construction is run without you actually showing up or doing anything with it. Maybe you just really only kind of have to dip your toe in the water, maybe work an hour a week on it. Maybe just be there for the vision and the trains going this way, let's go. Maybe you're more along that lines of things and you have teams of people doing things. You're trading money for time. Basically, you're paying other people to do the work to get your time back. You can definitely run, a be a business owner, a true business owner with great systems and processes in the real estate world. There's a lot of them out there. There's also a lot of people out there that say they are, but in reality, they're over here, all right? So don't forget that. And then if you do enough of this, maybe one day you can go to the I quadrant. That's the hopes, right? Maybe you've saved up enough money. Maybe you've invested in real estate enough. Maybe you're passive in a lot of deals. Maybe you're an LP, a limited partner in a number of syndications. Maybe you've all of a sudden, like, I don't know, got a bunch of multifamily properties and they're all running on autopilot because you outsourced it to third-party property management. Or maybe you own the third-party property management company internally, but it's run completely and independent of you. Or maybe, just maybe, you didn't take this path and instead you said, hey, I'm making decent money and I'm just gonna take time to go over here to the I quadrant by sitting there investing my money in real estate, buying some doors every year, 1031 exchanging some properties every year, investing as an LP limited partner in syndications and funds every year, taking excess money and turning it again and again. And you live on your active income as an employee and you invest passively in real estate or other assets out there until one day that passive income or your investment dollars, your dollars duplicating over dollars, which is what investors focus on, pays enough to build your wealth to pay for your lifestyle. You can also do that from going from employee, self-employed to investor. Maybe you stay in the S quadrant and you never build a big business. You don't want 30 employees. You don't want all this overhead and management and so forth. But instead you go flip some houses every year and you take that extra cash that you're making that extra active income, active income sucks tax wise, and you start investing it passively in other investment vehicles. Maybe in other people's LP stuff, syndications, your own, you buy off some, pay off some of your properties, you buy a small multi, commercial, whatever it might be, and you start investing your proceeds, your active income from being self-employed back into real estate to one day become an investor again. You can do this in so many different ways that that's just the nature of this business. It's great. It's your journey. It's your choice. Don't just follow somebody saying, I got a 10,000 units in real estate and that's the only way to do it. No, it's not. There's people out there that have 20 houses paid off that are managed by a third-party property management company and they live happily ever after as an investor. Every now and then they get a phone call. Every now and then they have an eviction maybe. Every now and then a roof falls out, right? Something like that. And maybe they have to work for a couple hours a month, right? To be able to shut that thing down or fix it or whatever it might be. But there's tons and tons of people out there that have 10 to 20 houses in their 60s, 50s, 40s, whatever it is that are paid off and they live a very happy, I quadrant life while they're able to go do what they really want to go do. So first and foremost, if you're going to go from here to here, you have to be true to who you are and true to where you are in your current business. Are you by yourself? Yes. Okay, cool. What is your main purpose? What's your main goal that you want in your real estate career? Do you want to be active in real estate? Do you love touching the houses? Do you love looking at them? Do you want to make all your money flipping? Do you want to be able to sit there and make all the decisions? Are you more of an active investor or you want to be more passive would you rather have a portfolio of houses paid off would you rather go invest as an lp and not be bothered would you rather go have 100 200 units that you're not in charge of at all and somebody else is would you rather have that path or do you want to do a combination of both that decision needs to be made and needs to be made early in my opinion what challenges have people have as they're in this category over here is they don't really know their direction yet what direction are they going to go in their business to get from here to here? If you're all over the place, like I was at one point when I was early in the career in this business, and I did everything. I was invested in different things. I wholesaled, I invested, I flipped, I kept. I actually had a little side software company. I did anything it took. I did some loans, right? Anything it took to make money, which spread me out all over the place. The second I decided to say I flip houses, single family homes in one geographic area, actually it was like three geographic areas, and we do a very specific cash on cash return, very specific type of property that we're looking for, and that's all I do. As soon as I did that, I started going from here to here. Just with that one decision, we were able to build business processes, business systems, focusing on one really good thing about our business, which was the type of flips we did, and start building systems to get become duplicatable 
and put other people in charge of them to start transitioning me over here to the business owner side. So what's the niche? What's the thing you're trying to do? If I'm trying to be, if I'm trying to make all my money in active income, fix and flip, but I still have to drive all the houses, or if I don't feel comfortable buying properties without me personally seeing it, you're going to be here all the time. This is what it is. Accept it. Now, if you did some of the things that I did, which is define a box, a buy criteria, very specific buy criteria in different geographic locations with a very specific type of rehab, very specific type of property that we're looking for, and then built some processes around it, such as what does it take for me to feel comfortable buying a property without seeing it? Well, there's a lot of videos I've done over the years that you can watch uh, on Bigger Pockets about me doing property analysis on properties of properties that I never walked. And if you go back on YouTube and watch those on Bigger Pockets, you'll see how I've done it over the years. Number one thing that I need, if I'm not going to go see the property, I need photos or my team needs photos. So can we get 100, 200 photos of a property and all the different red flag checklist situations that can happen on a property? Do we need to get a property inspection? Do we need comparables? Yes, we need comps to show ARV and we need comps to show as is. Do we know what kind of rehab scope needs to be done on this property to get to the ARV after repair value? Do we have that filed? Do we have, a, do we have title insurance pulled? Or do we have a preliminary title pulled so we can see if there's any issues there? Yes. What about our inspections? What about sewer? What about all these other aspects that come with making decisions to know if a property is good or not? We also later added checks and balances once we knew, hey, we need these five or six things to be able to say yes or no to a property to analyze it and underwrite it quickly. Once we knew those five or six things, we could document those five or six things to say, okay, every property we buy needs these things before we could say yes to buying them, okay? Now, once we had that, I could run that, yes, and still be here and make those decisions and look at the pictures, look at the title reports, look at the comps, pull it myself, great. That's the first step, go do that. The second step is who can I have outsource one of these things? Maybe somebody else can take 150 photos of the property. Maybe somebody else can pull comps. Maybe somebody else can get re re review the title report. Maybe somebody else can go coordinate the sewer inspection or whatever it might be. So those are things you can start outsourcing. Eventually, other people are doing those things for you. A lot of times it's free, believe it or not. And they're bringing that data back to you. After I get all that data, that was the next step, still self-employed. I would review all the data and then make a decision on buying a property, but I never walked it and I never had to pull all the data or anything like that. Other people did, but I still had to review it. Eventually, one more step further is I actually had two team members be in charge of saying yes to a property or no. They both had to agree on it. So I just basically said, okay, Nate and Serena, their names. I said, you two, if you, die, if you both say yes to this property, then we'll buy it. If one of you guys says no, we don't buy it. So they had to go work together as a team. They knew the buying criteria. They knew how to, the, to analyze the deals. They both had pluses and minuses on what they were good at. Serena was really good at the rehab, construction, design, ARV stuff. Nate was really good at the acquisitions and figuring out the data for that, the comps and as is. And together, they were able to decide whether or not a property should be purchased or not. I was the tiebreaker. That was the only time that I had to show up if there was an issue or not, right? So maybe I still floated here. But ultimately, I was able to outsource most of the buying decisions when it comes to the property and start leaning more towards here. You can do that with construction. You can do that with rehab. You can do that with uh, the property management side. You can do that with each thing, but all starts with what makes you feel comfortable not showing up to the property? What data do you need to make a decision on a property without you physically having to go there? Just write that stuff out. And then you can start working on a process to say, okay, if I'm never going to go to that property and I only need this data to say yes or no to it in a certain way, cool. That becomes the start of your system. That becomes the start of your SOP, your standard operating procedures, to be able to say yes or no to a property quickly. And that all starts with the niches. What do you invest in? So I went on around with that, but you can do that with each aspect of your business. Construction rehab, budget scopes. You can do that with quality control. You can do that with your property management side of things. How to source a property manager, like all those things. How to source a tenant. If you run that stuff yourself, it all starts with sitting down, putting pen to paper, and writing out an SOP process for what you need in order to make a yes or no decision on something. Sounds simple, but I bet you most of you aren't going to do it. I bet you most of you watching this are going to be like, yeah, that's great. I should do that. And then get overwhelmed by the number of things that have to happen in order for you to process out and go over here and you go back to doing what you've always done. Well, guess what? I got news, everybody. If you keep doing the things you've always done, you'll keep getting the same results you've always got. So change something up. Start this week.
sit down and say, I'm going to do one process. I'm going to work on one thing in my business right now to start systemizing and creating an SOP, standard operating procedure for one thing in my business this week, just one. Maybe it's taking photos. Maybe it's pulling comps. Maybe it's reviewing title. Maybe it's sourcing a contractor. Just write it out. Start all it takes with one and do one a week. You'd be surprised 52 weeks later, one year, you're going to be somewhere 12 months from now. And would you rather have your future self be happy with you or not? I bet you your future self is going to be a lot happier if you start today transitioning from this side to this side more proactively. And it all takes, honestly, proactively working on the things that maybe don't seem that important today, but they're very important later. So keep that in mind. Now, at the end of the day, once you're over here or once you're transitioning over here, this investor side, it can be tricky. It can be tricky because you can think that you're actually over here this whole time, but in reality, you're still self-employed because if you're still running all your property management, if you're still in charge of all the repairs and so forth, passive real estate isn't, isn't so passive uh, if you're running all the property management. So keep that in mind. There's def definitely true ways to become uh, passive in real estate. And there's a lot of videos out there that talk about it, but just because you have a hundred doors doesn't mean you're passive. And you know that if you have a hundred doors, it can be very, very active <laughs> if you have a hundred doors. So keep that in mind. That's another topic for another day, but the goal is to get there. So make sure you guys comment, like, subscribe to this video, ask questions on the YouTube. You guys can also follow me at Tarl Yarber on Instagram, and I'll see you on the next video.